Hospital Delhi. Uh, please come on stage, sir. strategies according to us are most important is the surgeon factor then mesh factor and the patient factor and surgeon is the most important prognostic factor if we are trained enough if we are taking care of every small bit then only will be able to deliver the best now all of us know that the options for implanting mesh are right from intraperitoneal, I form which we call this as, then I form plus, then preperitoneal, retromuscular, onlay and so, inlay and so on and so forth. But still, as Dr. Atul Mishra was also mentioning, till date, the recurrence rate has not come down to zero. Even if inlay 20 to 30 percent, and sublay uh, is less than 4%, but still the seasonal hernias, re 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 recurrent hernias are occurring and is out of the order of 3 to 11%. Recurrence even after placing the prosthetic mesh is also 20 to 33%. And then explantation of the mesh is required in contaminated wounds in approximately 50 to 90%. As we mentioned, that IPOM has been widely practiced since 94. We started laparoscopic IPOM repair in way back in 93, 94, and we have been doing it, but we have been get, getting the cases in which, for example, open mesh repair has been done, still the recurrence has been there, and when we go in with laparoscopy, there are occasions, I would say more occasions, when the adhesions are present, shrinkage is present, and then we have to go in for placing the mesh, and this mesh, I will go on in details after some time, this is a proceed mesh, and as I showed you yesterday in the workshop also, that we fix it on the four corners, and with the help of attacker also, we make sure that the hernial recurrence is not there. And we have been practicing this for last so many years, but way back, approximately seven years back, then we started doing the IPOM plus in order to prevent any seroma formation. What I mean to say is that we should carry on learning, unlearning, learning, and relearning. And it is a beautiful paper which had come about the predictive factors for recurrence in laparoscopic hernia repair using a bridging technique. The initially, we were always mentioning that it should be covered by at least 4 to 5 centimeters all around. But now, it is the question of mesh defect ratio. If the mesh defect ratio is less than 8 or it is more than 16, that will make, make the change of recurrence from 70% to 0%. 
and the mesh factor, so many of meshes have come and gone also. Basically, they can be divided into synthetic mesh and biological graphs. There are different indications. I would not go into the details of it, but I would request that when we are using any kind of mesh, we should be very careful in choosing that. For example, physio mesh was seen and ultimately recurrence rate and was according to the mesh repair, mesh type also, and now it has been withdrawn. So thinking is that we should never ever believe that it is the ideal mesh which has arrived, no. The adhesions would form with every mesh, shrinkage will be there with every mesh and mesh infection can also occur with every kind of mesh and we should know that we give lot of importance to the placement of the mesh when there is no infection or contamination from outside. I would request our younger colleagues to go into the details of these papers which in which guidelines have been given in the endo hernia society and one should definitely go into details and then find out whether approximately 8 cm, 10 cm defects can be managed by laparoscopy or not. Now for last few years we have seen the era of AWR and it is changing very very fast so one should carry on learning for example if we are doing the hernia repair and if we have caused the entrotomy then it is imperative that we either according to our expertise either we open the abdomen and do the entrotomy repair or if we are doing able to do the by laparoscopic method yes one can go ahead but please do not place in a mesh if the mesh is placed, then the chances of infection are definitely increased later on. And the, regarding the seroma formation, we always tell the patient in pre-operative period that the patient is, you are going to have a seroma and external pressure has been applied. But usually, normally, it would take 3 weeks, 6 weeks, 10 weeks and so on and so forth and the seroma subsides. So it is not a good idea to aspirate the seroma anytime and every time and convert this seroma into an abscess. About the latest developments of ETEP, we had an excellent session in the year, yesterday also in the morning also. Our thinking is that yes, balanced case selection has to be there and there is a very thin line between ethical and unethical practice. But again, see the whole of the patient rather than whole of the patient. What I mean to say, this kind of patient had the ventral hernia repair done by open method. Many surgeons believe that open method will not lead on to intestinal adhesions, but it will. And as we go in, and in this kind of situation, that if the patient had presented with vomiting after open ventral hernia repair, and then when we did the bowel walking, we found that there was a query mass in the and there was a stricture in the small bowel and then ultimately we had to do the resection and osmosis and the patient did well. What I mean to say it is imperative when we are taking these kind of challenges, these kind of patients, one should always get the CT scan done and then see the whole of the patient rather than just whole of the patient. And in this we could do the resection and osmosis and then ultimately patient did well. Similarly, if it Swiss cheese defects, then one should not mess with the infection. Our thinking is many surgeons I have seen that still using the proline mesh, Imagine. definitely adhesions form with proceed mesh also, with all kind Hello. of meshes. But again, the thought is that if the infection occurs, then one should prepare the patient that you are going to have the explantation of the mesh sooner or later. In the initial phase, one may go on with usage of the antibiotic or I would urge my younger colleagues not to go in for tubercular, anti-tubercular treatment without evidence. If there is evidence, yes, one should. But if there is a discharging sinus, if for example, now in this situation, you can see so much of adhesions are there, mesh has been placed, it becomes definitely challenging. So all meshes will lead on to adhesions, all meshes can shrink, all meshes can lead on to. For example, in this situation, one can see that there was a discharging sinus and ultimately we had to do the mesh explantation. Be believe me, whether it is proline, whether it is proceed, whether it is polyester, we have re removed enough of these mesh meshes to give us many lessons. So thinking is 
that yes, if we are able to use it with judiciousness, then only it will have a lot of impact. And now in this kind of situation, the surgeon had got the, the did the best, had he repaired the ventral hernia, and after getting this, the patient continued to have discharging sinus, and then when she came to us, we got the CT scan done, and CT scan revealed that there was a pus. And now, going back into the history, can you imagine, the patient had presented with perforation hepatitis after five days of hernia repair, of eye palm repair, and then the surgeon had done was, did the laparotomy, did the enterotomy closure, and then came out without removing the mesh. Our thinking is, and you can see the suture line which had been placed, and that is uh, the suture line, that means they must have gone through the mesh to do the enterotomy repair, but they did not explant the mesh. Our thinking is that one has to go in for implantation of these meshes. And lot of such kind of challenging situations can occur. So our thinking is that one should have a low threshold of getting the CT scan done. And if you get the CT scan done, the counts are also high. You can see, you can appreciate the mesh and then the infection is there and one has to go in for explantation. But make sure that when the patient is going in for mesh explantation, then we go in have the x-ray also, we count the number of tags and all the tags have to be taken out, then only we will be able to do the justice. Because even if you leave one foreign body behind, that will lead on to challenge later on and that will become a recurrent kind of sinus. Again, there is a question about whether one should use the absorbable tax or non-absorbable tax as i mentioned yesterday also we use the non-absorbable tax because we are already using the non-absorbable mesh but there are situations in which one has used the use uh, this, uh, these absorbables also but there can be some situations for example now you can see with the tag the adhesions are formed and that led on to the intestinal obstruction and ultimately we had to do the adenolysis and then the patient did well so thinking is loud and clear that these adhesions would form one has to be very very cautious whether to take these kind of challenges or not in the practice, no, I don't think so. Whether the size matters, yes, the size matters. As I mentioned, 6 centimeters and above going for AWR, less than 6 centimeters, one can go in for the repairs in this. And now again, as I mentioned yesterday also, uh, to R is human, to refer is divine. If this kind of situation is there, and this, this patient had presented with uh, 142 kg, 62 BMI, MG, mini gastric bypass had been done, hernia was reduced but not repaired. These again, I am just touching on the aspects of managing the obesity as well as hernia. There are different schools of thought. Many surgeons would re repair the hernia simultaneously as mystery gastrectomy or bypass or mini gastric bypass. Some would not. But ultimately, our lesson is that we would not do, we would not interfere with hernia repair, but we will make sure that we will do it later on. But in this situation, the surgeon had reduced the hernia content. And then patient presented on day six with the obstruction and with the vomiting, recurrent vomiting. And when we got the CT scan done, you can see the standing of the bowel loop. And this is the patient who presented after six days with vomiting. And when we went in, we found that there was a defect and the small bowel had gone in. We asked for the video of the previous surgeon also, previous case also, and there was momentum only. But in this case, mini gastric bypass was done and ultimately our realization was that when we went in, we have a low threshold of going in for, with laparoscope. What I mean to say, one should always put in a laparoscope, but one should have the thoughts in mind that one may have to do the hybrid repair. And in this situation, you can appreciate that the bowel loop had gone into the defect and then we could reduce the defect. And then we found that the, at this stage, we would not love now you can see this is the intestine which is coming out and then we did and this is a morbid a obese patient after six days of going in for many gastric bypass and then we are reducing the content and in this stage now you see that this is a big defect so what we did was that we made an incision onto the anterior abdominal wall 
did the anatomical closure of the defect we did do not wish to place in a mesh even after six days because of the chances of infection and we repaired the uh, this uh, hernia defect from outside but as the habit is that check 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 recheck cross check counter check check and check so we did the endoscopy and uh, it was uh, honestly uh, surprising for us also to note that when we did the check endoscopy at the side you can see the bubbles coming out as the endoscope is going in the bubbles are coming in then you can see the endoscope at the side of gastro me there was a leak what I mean to say that if we had not done the endoscope operative endoscopy we would have missed this leak and that would have caused sure shot cascade of events and the patient would have come so what i mean to say is that see the whole of the patient rather than the whole of the patient and and in this situation we could save the patient because and because of the intestine going into the defect there was a proximal pressure building and that led must have led on to the her, this uh, leak also at the gastrogenostomy and this was repaired well and the patient did well so similarly, and we, we believe on check endoscopy on the table and we found out that after doing the uh, repair of the, yes, we, I will just finish it off for four minutes, yes. So the check endoscopy revealed that there is no leak and then ultimately <laughs> patient did well. And then it is very, very clear that complications in laparoscopic hernia repair is reflection of the learning curve and patient selection and not inherent to the technique. The surgeon is the most important prognostic factor. So one should be very, very careful. For example, this is a patient who had right-sided inguinal hernia, but bilateral hernia was repaired. And after some time, the patient started having a discharging sinus from the left side. Though patient did not have any, any hernia on the left side, but bilateral repair was done. And then the discharging sinus was explored somewhere. And after that, the mesh was taken out. And still, after a few months of the antibiotics and anticox and whatnot, the patients had the discharge in sinus. And then when patient came to us, the, an explantation of the mesh was also done. When the patient came to us, we got the CT scan done. And now you can see, as, as somebody was mentioning, complementary ventral hernia was given to him. And this is the ventral hernia which was there on the left side. And there was a collection also. Why I am insisting on showing and seeing the CT scan is that as a hernia surgeon or as a bariatric surgeon, one should form a habit of reading the CT scans once so that we are able to judge. And in this situation, you can see the collection and you can see the ventral hernia. So we went in with diagnostic laparoscopy and uh, on diagnostic laparoscopy we found that there was a collection and if there is a contamination, if there is a con uh, collection inside and there is a hernia, so in this situation it is not a good idea to put in a synthetic mesh. If you put, if we put in a synthetic mesh, that can get infected and that will ultimately take the patient back to square one where it started, that means the discharging sinus. So our thoughts are that in this kind of situation, though there is a role of biological meshes and in this, for example, once we took out the collection and once we dissected it, so there was a recurrence of inguinal hernia on the left side, one, weakness of the defect and then there was a ventral hernia also. So we placed two pieces of uh, biological mesh and then the patient did well and he, he has, this is the biological mesh, this has to be wet and then it has to be secured with the tacker and ultimately the patient did well. So thinking is that become a thinking surgeon rather than a manual laborer. One should carry on thinking that in what way we have to unlearn, learn and relearn and then we can give the best to the patient. Now this, in this, you can see that we are fixing. Similarly, this patient had presented with post hysterectomy ventral hernia with collection. And again, you can see the CT scan done and it is a collection. But ultimately, we went in and we found that post hysterectomy, you can see the abdomen, post hysterectomy, once we go in, we find there is a collection, but there was a mop. There was a cosipobioma, textiloma as we call this as, and when we went in, we took that cosipobioma out, 
and there was a hernia also. So in this kind of situation, again, because it is an infected environment, so you have to have in your armamentorium these kind of uh, biological meshes, biological graphs as we call this as, rather than relying on to the synthetic meshes or relying only to the anatomical repair because the, this is the situation in which the even the anatomical repair would fail and up just behind this we just converted into an open method and placed in a biological mesh and then ultimately patient did well so thinking is loud and clear that one should be aware of these kind of situation we placed in the biological mesh and the patient did well similarly so many case scenarios are there in which the collection is there so if we get this CT scan done we have to take these collections as well as the meshes are explanted has to be done then only now this is the last slide of showing after sleeve just at me for example if the cannulas are just taken away like that then the patient presented just two days after sleep gastrectomy done elsewhere and one could see on CT scan also that intestine had gone in. What I mean to say, all the entries have to be shown, all the exits have to be shown and then only you will pick up or you will treat these kind of patients. And if these patients present with vomiting and we would have done just the endoscopy, we would not have done the justice, we would not have put, uh, placed it. So I'm thinking is practice till it hurts, keep practicing till it does not hurt. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for giving this attention. Thanks a lot. Any questions, I am more than happy to answer. Uh, I don't think we'll be taking any questions right now, so I'm sorry, because there's a session going on. But I think the take, just the take home message is that probably uh, since we are putting a prosthetic, we should just be careful that it's a, uh, uh, it's a foreign body. That is number one. And all the precautions to take for our body inside have to be taken care of. As well as, I would suggest all the young surgeons to note that anatomy is the most important precaution that you can take for anybody. You should be really a master of anatomy. Thank you, Dr. Bhatia, for your wonderful Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.